Awesome that as the Fergus came up here, the sun came out. Isn't that awesome? I don't know what that means from God, but I guess his light's shining on you guys and wants to welcome you here too. So the message, the title of the message today is Power From On High. Doesn't that fire you up? Yes. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Well, Mike. I don't know if you've ever uh, felt powerful before. Have you ever felt powerful? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All the brothers are like, yeah. <laughs> Anthony rode in on his motorcycle today, and you're like, man, that is powerful right there. There's something about just uh, a cranking sport bike. It's a uh, 160 horsepower, and just to pull up with this custom exhaust and these new LED lights, and you're like, man, that that's power right there, amen? Yeah. Some guys believe that their motorcycles make them powerful, but Anthony has even more than that, amen? Yeah, amen. I remember for me, I I always wanted to be a great basketball player. Come on, bro. I used awesome. To, I watched uh, a movie called Pistol Pete back in the day. Oh, yeah. And uh, Pistol Pete Maravich was my inspiration. I thought if this skinny little white kid could be a cranking basketball player, then, on, then maybe I could be powerful in basketball, too. Come on, bro. And so I went to a basketball camp and I wasn't powerful. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and so after a while of practicing and playing games and not getting called, and I was on a basketball league and I was usually on the bench, uh, I just realized maybe basketball is not my powerful strength right here. And so then I decided to, to go into other fields. Come on. But, uh, but I, I, I retook the, the vision of being powerful in basketball in Chicago. And I started going out to UIC, Come on, UIC. Illinois and yeah, Chicago, and we, they have this great basketball court. Yeah. And because Brittany's an alumni, I got like super cheap membership to UIC. Come on, bro. And I showed up, and I thought, I'm going to learn to be a powerful player on the court right here. And as I played, I'd bring friends out, and I'd say, how am I doing? <laughs> and Omar, uh, a guy that me and Anthony we were reaching out to, and Come Anthony on, yeah. was able to help him get restored to the Lord. Omar says, you're, you're pretty bad, bro. We <laughs> said, but it's okay, because you're learning. You're learning. And Omar is like a wrecking ball on the court. Oh yes. I mean, nobody, he's just this huge guy that as much as you try to stop him, he just is like a bowling ball going through the pins. You know what I mean? Everybody's just flying all over the place as he makes his layup. But it was cool because I was his minister, so he would pass me the ball. <laughs> And so, if Omar passed me the ball, everybody else on the court said, maybe there's something this guy we don't see, you know? But there wasn't. There wasn't. It was just us. <laughs> so, finally, after months and months of us playing, Omar encouraged me. And he said, I know you used to be bad, but now you're okay. <laughs> and I said, yes. I'm an okay basketball player. <laughs> and I retired there and I haven't touched the court since. I'm leaving it okay. But there was one point where I remember getting a basketball pass thrown to me, which was rare, but I was fired up. And I thought, I can't mess this opportunity up. And so in my heart, I knew I had all the power I needed to be a cranking basketball player. And I go up and I shoot a shot, three point, for the winning point of the game. And I swish it. Come on, bro! And I just stop and I'm like, I'm a powerful teammate here. <laughs> you were, bro, you were. Hey, Amen. Hey, Amen. And so, really, I think for a lot of us, we want to be powerful at the things that we love. Yeah. And so, Jesus, right here, it's, it's intense because we're going to talk about power as a disciple. Come Amen. And, and even that it's important as a disciple of Jesus to have power in your life. Amen. Come on. Amen, guys? Yeah. Do you believe that? Yeah. yeah. I hope you will after this. Let's go to Luke 24. Come on, bro. And we're going to pick it up at his very last words of Luke as he's preparing the guys for the kingdom. Come on, bro. And he says in verse uh, 49, he says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. yeah. So here, Jesus says, Stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Did the disciples know what he was talking about? No. No clue. But were they fired up? 
Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Why? Because the guy that was talking to him had risen from the dead. Amen. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. They didn't believe, they didn't really know if he was a prophet or what. Some of them thought he was Messiah, some of them weren't sure. But then he gets killed right in front of them. And then he comes back to life. And at that point, their hearts changed. Imagine if that were to happen to you. You see a guy and you see him obviously die right before your eyes. And people even made sure he was dead by stabbing him one last time. And you say, okay, he's definitely dead. And then they bury him. And you watch all this. And then three days later, he's back. And when that happens, he could say anything. <laughs> and you're gonna accept it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He could say, guys, the, the, the sky's yellow. Oh. Say, amen? Yeah. He rose from the dead, he said sky's yellow, sky's yellow. Yeah. He rose from the dead. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He could say, you know, hey, make sure you go to all nations, baptize them in my name, yep. and then teach, teach, make them disciples, baptize them, and then teach them to obey everything I've commanded. Right. You say, dude, you rose from the dead. That's all the proof I need to do what you said. And now he tells them, stay in the city till you're clothed. I have no idea what he's talking about, but I'm staying here. Amen? Amen. I think, just real quick before we jump into it, come on, Mike. When you're in touch with Jesus rising from the dead, you don't need to understand what he's talking about. You know what I mean? It doesn't need to make sense. You understand one thing he rose from the dead. Right. That's all the proof somebody needs. This guy knows what he's talking about. He died, and now he's back to life. This is powerful. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that, in and of itself, is the first thing that helped these men to be clothed with the power from on high, is to realize the power of the resurrection. Amen? Amen. Amen. When, they resurre- when they understood that, and they recognized the power of the resurrection, then what was to follow? Power from on high. Here, as you're living your life, as you're reading the Bible, as you're praying, do you understand what Jesus is saying to you? That he doesn't need to make sense as much as we think he does. All that you need to know is he rose from the dead. Talk about it. And you got to figure out if that's true or not. And once you figure out whether that's true or not, nothing else matters. Amen? Amen. Amen. He could say the sky's yellow. If you know he rose from the dead and you understand that that's a fact, then amen. Sky's yellow. I'm going with that one. He could say, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and I'll take care of everything else. You say, he rose from the dead. I'm putting that one into practice. <laughs> right. yeah. Come on, bro. He can say, it's better to give than to receive. You say, well, he rose from the dead. Sometimes I don't get it, but it's true. Right. Come on, bro. He can say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Yeah. And you can say, whoa, that doesn't make sense, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. You got to figure out one thing. Did Jesus rise from the dead? And when he, when you understand that, everything changes in your life. Amen. Yeah. Come on, Mike. So anyway, these guys got it. Amen? Amen. And so guess what they did when he said, stay in the city till you're clothed with power from on high. The the they said, okay, let's stay in the city, guys. <laughs> till we get clothed with this power from on high that he's talking about. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Come on, bro. Come on, Mike. Preach it. So here, we usually think it's the beginning of Acts that's the power of on high, but we're going to look and see that it's actually something else that's the power from on high. Come on. Two verse one, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they're staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Most people say, there you go. Power check. <laughs> right? Bunch of guys in a room, huge ball of fire comes down, flames over everybody's head, and then they're speaking in other dialects and languages of the people that came to visit the city. Come on. Not, you know, they weren't just like gibberish kind of weird stuff. Yeah. It was literally speaking like Tagalog, Russian. They were speaking, uh, you know, Ar Arabic. They're speaking all these different Big languages. Language. And they're all... <laughs> I looked at Sheila. <laughs> they were all from Galilee. They were all these Jewish guys. Imagine a bunch of Jewish guys speaking Arabic. Well, that's pretty obvious. But maybe Spanish, Spanish yeah. Japanese, yeah. Chinese, Swahili. Tagalog, English. English. Yeah. That would freak you out. But that was only the beginning of the power. Amen, bro. Because everybody's wondering what the heck is going on. Yeah. And then Peter gets up and he preaches the word. Yep. 2 verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to oh. this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you. Through him, as yourselves, you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with a the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yes. Imagine a guy comes back from the dead, and it's impossible for death to even keep its hold on him. Wow. That was Jesus. Come on, Mike. He keeps preaching. And in verse 36, he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promises for you and your children are for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number Amen. that day. Come on, bro. There's the beginning of the power. For us, we gotta see what is the power all about. Because the speaking in tongues was miraculous, yes. But it was only a tool to bring people to the true power. Come on, bro, talk Come about on, it. Bro. They didn't have the New Testament, so they needed to gain credibility by a miracle from God. Come on, bro, preach that. But now, you can say, well, no more tongues because we got the Bible. We got what they didn't have. Perfection. The miracles, too bad we're not on that same level. I want to change your mind on that, guys. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I want you to realize that the power wasn't just in the speaking of tongues. It was something far more powerful. The power that Jesus said that's going to come to you from on high when you read through the Bible, the New Testament after this, never is the speaking in tongues or the miracles referred to as the power from on high. That's right. Let's look at Ephesians. Come on, bro. Come on, Mike. Go ahead, bro. Verse 14. Oh my. Chapter 3 of Ephesians. It says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. <laughs> and I pray that you, 
being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God come on bro now to him who's able to do measurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen, amen. amen. you know right here Power is used a few times. You see it? Yeah. But Paul is saying the power isn't from these crazy miracles or awesome gifts. Paul says the power is within us through God's spirit. Right. Isn't that intense? And Paul, Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of Holy the Spirit. Holy Spirit. The power was repentance and baptism. Mm. Isn't that awesome? Because that's what gets you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right. Here, first he says, listen, I'm praying about it. And I want you to be strengthened with the power from his spirit in your inner being. God's power strengthens us first in our hearts. Is there power in your heart today? Mm, question. We can struggle with a lot of different things. One brother was texting me yesterday and he got open about some sin. And afterwards, he, I was like, bro, you confessed it. You're, you're going after repentance. God, the Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, God forgives your sin and heals you. And the reply was, yeah, but now I gotta heal myself. I gotta forgive myself. Because I think a lot of times our sin can cause us to hate ourselves and we stop being powerful in God because we hate ourselves so yeah. much. Wow. Talk about that, bro. We hate, we see our mistakes. And in our pride, we think, wow, I can't believe I made a mistake. I can't believe that I am human. <laughs> I can't believe that I am inherently flawed. This is crazy. I hate myself. And so the first part is realizing, number one, that we got to have power in our hearts. But then he says, so here's what I want. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp Jesus' love. Is that intense? Yeah. He doesn't just say grasp it. He says, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Isn't that intense, guys? Guys, it's not just, it's not just normal. It's literally huge. It is massive. Today, you're going to see tankers go through that Golden Gate Bridge that are wide and high and they go deep. God's love makes those things look like little toy sailboats. Mm. And so what becomes the issue? We don't get it. We, we don't have the power to understand it. Is that intense? Have you ever watched The Passion of the Christ? Yes. For me, when I watch that movie, it's weird because it's so powerful that it actually bounces off of my heart. You know what I mean? I remember when it first came out in 2004, or 2003, and I, I think it was 2004 and I was really tanking. 
And I went with our ministry to go watch it. But I was also half involved in the world and dating a girl at my job and things like that. And I knew I was tanking spiritually. And I walked in and I was watching the movie in the theater with the other disciples. And I left and I went outside. I couldn't watch it. I couldn't see what Jesus had done. I couldn't see this, this sacrifice made for me. I couldn't see what Christianity was all about because I wasn't committed to it. And my heart hardened. And I now own the DVD. Amen. Amen, bro. Amen. And we watch it with different people as they're deciding to become disciples. And as you watch it, you're just sitting there and it's just, there's no real comedic relief. You know what I mean? It's, it's, there's no, it doesn't lighten up. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And I remember thinking, I can't, I it's, it's not hitting me. I know it's supposed to, but it's not getting to my heart. And because I grew up in the church, I've heard about the story of the cross my whole life. You know what I mean? And when you hear it your whole life, you're just like, yep, heard this one. I've heard this since I was a kid. Jesus died for my sins. Oh, wow. Huge revelation. Wow. I've heard that since I was a baby. That was like almost my first words. <laughs> but I didn't have the faith to go along with it, to understand it. And so here, I'm watching it. I'm not getting it. And I had to start thinking more realistically. And I thought, man, what would it be like if one of my friends did this for me? I was imagining, okay, what if Gary knew I deserved a punishment and begged to get the punishment himself and said, no, 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 don't beat him to death, almost to death, and then kill him. I, I want to get beaten to death instead. And I'm standing there as... Gary is getting bashed in the face, punched, spit on, whipped, and then crucified and bleeds to death as he's hanging on a cross. I just think, man, this guy loves me. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And if that happened, what do I say? I mean, I, is there any pride that I can have? No, that'd be pretty stupid, right? Wow, I'm so awesome. Of course, Gary died. Whoa. The only response you can have is, what do I do? How, how do I respond? What's the, what's the way to respond to this? Somebody loved me enough to die for me. Guys, that's beyond our understanding. Yeah. Honestly, you probably don't fully get it right now. Yeah. But that should kind of freak you out. You right now barely understand what this is all about. You don't get it. Because it's, even Paul prayed, I pray God give you the power to understand this stuff. Right. In Acts 2, these guys got it. Because what did they ask after they heard the message? Brothers, what do we do? How do I respond to this? And he says, repent and be baptized. In our world, guys, there's seven billion humans on this planet. Almost eight billion. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. But for Gary to die for me would mean that he loves me and values my life. Amen. I'm valued to Gary. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now what's crazier than that is that Jesus, God's son, died for me. God values my life. Mm. Isn't that intense? That's awesome, bro. Come on. That's why in Matthew 6, 33, he says, listen, don't worry about the birds of the air. I mean, God takes care of them. You're more valuable than they are. God didn't die for the birds. He died for you. He died for me. And that means God values my life. That 
that means I matter. Yeah. Is that intense? And so, in a world of almost 8 billion, what's the thing that we're told over and over and thought about? You don't matter. Yes. Right. There's 8 billion people on this earth. You think you really matter? You maybe matter to one or two people, but that's about it. You know what I mean? But imagine if you had a billion ants right here on the ground. You'd think, what is one ant out of a billion? You know what I mean? You can even like stomp and kill a few hundred of them. You think that literally did not change anything right now. Those ants are valueless. Now imagine eight billion ants. Imagine this whole place covered in eight billion ants right here. You think these ants don't matter at all, right? Think what's the, the death of one ant? Who cares? That doesn't matter. And the world wants us to believe, and even in our own worldly thinking, we start thinking that we're not really valued. Right. Guys, that's Satan's lie to you. Yep. Is that intense? Right? Talk about it, bro. Come on. If Gary died for me because he values my life, God died for me because he values my life. Satan wants me to think, what? The opposite, right? God doesn't value your life. And don't we get tempted with that all the time? Yeah, that's right. Don't we think, he doesn't value me. I'm one of seven billion. If he even knew my name out of eight billion, that would be amazing. But, but that's not the case. God's love is beyond what you can understand. Come on, Mike. God is so awesome that he values seven billion people so much, he would die for each single one of them over and over again. Wow. Uh, that's awesome. Can you grasp that? You can't. You don't understand how awesome God is. You know why? Because he's God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Real, bro. And Come what on. is God? God is love. That's what the Bible says, First John. So if God is love, and that's what pure, awesome, ultimate love looks like, you're a person, you will never understand God's love. And that's why Paul says, man, I really pray you can get it. Because once you understand God values you, it changes your life and you say, brothers, what shall we do? Amen. Amen? Yeah. When you realize he resurrected from the dead and he died for me, that changes my life. And the power on high can come. Amen. Because then you repent, you get baptized, and you have God's spirit within you that gives you the strength. Amen? Amen. Amen. Some of you guys live pathetic lives for God because you have yet to realize how much God loves you. Talk about it, bro. You don't do anything for God because you don't understand God's love. And you think you're valueless and you don't matter. And that's why God has yet to be able to work through you. Wow. Because the prayer is that you get it and you don't get it. The cross bounces off of you. You take communion and you don't realize that blood was shed for you. Yeah. Mm. So that you could be able to have power from on high. And so here we think, but I'm so weak, I'm so messed up. On the other hand, some of us start getting a little conceited. Uh -huh. And think, man, of course I'm so awesome. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 12. Come on, bro. Come on, Mike. Come on, bro. This is awesome, Mike. Great. Because Paul had the same struggle of becoming conceited, too. Come on, Mike. Okay, we gotta hurry up. We're with you, bro. Verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there has given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Wow. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
We'll stop right there. Well, real quick, he says, that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. Wow. All right. Weaknesses. Welcome to church. <laughs> we guys, being here, need to learn something from Paul. You're super weak. You are pathetically weak. It's sad how weak you truly are. Every single person here right now, no matter how much you can bench press or how pretty you are, you are pathetically weak, <laughs> right? Because you know your weaknesses, don't you? Yes. Yes. Can't you think through all the things you've messed up in? Yes. Maybe you can't, maybe you can't. With me and Gary, we had our D time yesterday and Gary was saying, you know, Mike, you're the evangelist of the church and I used to think that they were so far ahead of me I couldn't really help them, but I realized if I had that heart, you're gonna suffer. And so we went through and Gary challenged me on my marriage. And at first, honestly, I thought, my marriage is strong. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy's reading me a scripture about being unconcerned and arrogant towards Brittany. Oh, wow. <laughs> but then I had to like stop for a minute and realize, no, I need a lot of help. And I'm going to embrace this with all my heart because I know Gary's right. He's been right before. And if I just embrace it with all my heart and know I'm weak, then there's hope Amen. for my parents. Come on, Michael. Guys, we come here to church, and it's so sad when somebody comes trying to act like they're strong. You know what I mean? You show up, you're talking, you're laughing, you're hugging, you're having superficial conversations. And yet, really, the truth is, you're weak. Yeah. Every one of us here, guys, we're not awesome, okay? Right. Can we accept that together as a church? Right. Come on, bro. That we're really weak and jacked up. Yeah. Amen? Yes. Every single one here. And Paul says, I got to delight in my weakness. I want to challenge you guys to delight in your weaknesses. Mm. Yeah. Amen. And realize that God is going to be made perfect and powerful in your weakness. And so here's my challenge. To figure out what your weak is. <laughs> okay? What are you really weak in? You're not, now don't get all falsely humble and say I'm weak in everything. Because <laughs> that's not true. God has given you gifts. But God has also allowed you to have weaknesses. So maybe you need to realize what you're powerful in and talented in, but what you're weak at as well. You need to know both. Some people know all their weaknesses and they don't know that they're good at something. Some people know everything they're good at, but they don't know that they're weak at stuff. We need to be balanced and sober. Amen? That's right. What are you weak at? And if you already know 10 things you're weak at, then think of what you're good at. Amen? Because you're on the other side of the street. For me, I naturally don't know what I'm weak at. I naturally think I'm awesome at everything. I'm really good at all this stuff. I know people have criticism towards me, <laughs> but they're wrong. <laughs> because I'm awesome. <laughs> and so I have like to talk myself run. down from that yeah. ledge of pride that God's going to smash me on. You know what I mean? Yeah. And say, no, I'm not awesome. I'm actually really weak. I'm unconcerned about Britney sometimes and arrogant. I'm not on top of my schedule and I need to be. Yeah. I cannot be loving like I need to be and warm with people. And I can be in a bad mood sometimes. And I gotta realize that's me, that's my weaknesses. And I need to help, I need help, but I need to delight in those weaknesses, amen? amen. If we can delight in our weaknesses, guys, the faults with everybody else around you are not gonna bother you as much. Yes. Isn't that cool? Yes. You can say, hey, guess what? I'm weak too. <laughs> Let's be weak together and yes. focus on God. Yes. Because it's God's power that gives us perfection. It's not us, it's God. For us, I think, when we're in touch with the cross, we say, what can we do? But when we're not, we say, what can God's kingdom do for me? As a church, guys, we are raising our pledges across the board. And it's not just $2. $28 for each married couple, at least. $21 for each full-time working single, 
and 14 for every campus and part-time workers. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on, bro. When you realize that somebody died for you and you say, what do I do? And they say, well, give 20 more dollars a week. <laughs> You'd say, that's it? That's all I got to do? Can't I do more? When you're not in touch with the cross and somebody says, hey, you need to give 20 more dollars a week, you say, oh my gosh. <laughs> that's crazy. Do you realize that that's $80 a month? That's $80 a month. Now, if you were to take that person and say, hey, we'll hook you up with a nice house for $80 more a month, they'd say, sign me up. That's true. I am fired up. Yeah. Maybe even a nice car. Whoa, 80 bucks oh, oh. more for a nice car? Yeah. Yes. Isn't that intense, guys? Yeah. Drive it home, Mike. When we want something, we'll make it happen. Yeah. Right. And when we want to be grateful for Jesus and we say, thank you so much, what can I do? Guys, 21 bucks a week? That's pocket change, guys. But it'll do so much for the church to make it awesome. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. The other thing is you start working harder. You know what I mean? Yeah. In Acts 2, these people said, what do we do? And then for the next 30 years, they evangelize the whole entire world. That's right. <laughs> Isn't that cranking? Yeah. See, when we have that heart, we're able to say, I'll go anywhere, do anything, give up everything for God. Amen. And I'll evangelize this world for God. No matter if it's going to Cambodia or Manila or Thailand or going down to Sao Paulo, Brazil, or even cranking the UC Berkeley campus. Yeah. Woo. Guys, we're as much a part of world evangelism as another continent is. Yeah. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen. SF State is as much a part of evangelizing the world as Manila, Philippines. Amen. Do you have the same heart on your mission field? that these missionaries have when they go to other countries. Come on, that was like... Some of you say, well, I'm going to go, and when I get to Manila, oh my gosh, I am going to be so fruitful. <laughs> I'm just on, waiting to be sent. Here am I, send me. <laughs> and man, it is, I am going to be a fruit machine out there. <laughs> <laughs> but until then, I'm in this hard harvest field where there's not much going on. Wow. Guys, if you can't be fruitful here, you can't be fruitful in Manila. That's true. That's right. If you can't crank a campus here, you can't crank a city in another part of the world. Nope. People don't become more soft-hearted and less sinful on the other side of the planet. Amen? Amen? There's as much sin over in India as there is over here. Yeah. Maybe even more when you read about all those news reports of these murders and gang rapes that happen out there. So guys, it's equally as hard over there. Can you be fruitful here? And when you can, then you're ready to go on a mission. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what does that mean? We gotta work hard. We got a lot of awesome goals. We got goals of campus brothers, households, multiply. Yeah. Come on, bro. People, every student in campus getting a 4.0. Yes, come on. For the women to be multiplying and even have a women's Bible talk, a Latin women's Bible talk. Woo! For the teens, not just to be two teens, but 10 teens. But the awesome thing, even to become a club on campus. Come on, Ryan. The awesome thing is God has already started to answer those prayers. Guys. We fasted on Friday. God is saying, yes, I will be make you a club on campus. For us to have 10 teens, we need a teen ministry. Uh -oh. And so we were talking with uh, Robbie and Ashley and talking about the teen ministry for the church. With the Fergus getting here, man, we got plenty of teens yeah. that could be a part of an awesome teen ministry. Yeah. We got Kimmy as well, who's Come awesome. On, Come on, Kimmy. Ben is a fired up, cool young guy. Yeah. And Johnny is like the hardest working young kid I've ever met. Yeah. And then you got Justin and Jason leading them as teens too, Come on. as disciples. Come on, Jason. <laughs> And so we thought, well, Robbie's like a teen magnet. Even when he was on his honeymoon, teens were flocking around him on a cruise ship. And so we thought, Robbie, you're an intern, you're a teen magnet, even Johnny's sitting right next to you right now. Let's build a teen ministry with Robbie and Ashley as leading it as the team.
realize we will be starting a teen ministry. Amen? Yeah. And um, Robbie and Ashley still have the charge of evangelizing the SF State campus, but they'll be bringing teens onto the campus to study the Bible. Nice. And every other Saturday, we're going to be having teen events awesome. where all the teens will come together and have a teen devotion. Awesome. Amen? Yeah. So that'll be awesome. But they can't do it alone, so we needed some teen workers. So we asked Elliot and Sandra come to on, be the Elliot. teen workers. Ah! have a teen ministry in the San Francisco yeah. Church. Yeah. And I know all the parents say amen. <laughs> but here to see, you know why this happens, guys? Because God loves us. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. God really does love us. Even Dave and Tisha, as they came out, they didn't have a house or, or jobs. And so here it's like, amen, we just sold everything and we're living in San Francisco, no house, no jobs. Come on. Mm. And rent's pretty expensive. And so, but with no house, the kids also are in school. You know what I mean? So school started, guys. So their kids aren't just here just chilling. They're missing school as we speak. Maybe not Sunday as we speak. Amen. But at least Thursday and Friday as we were speaking then. Amen. And so that was part of the thing is what are we going to do? But also, we were praying, we're in pray, God, work out a quick miracle. Yeah. Yep. For some of us, it took months to find a house, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Just work out something quick for Dave and Tisha. And so, yesterday, Dave and Tisha found their house at the yeah. God opened up the doors. They didn't even require a credit check, guys. Oh my God. That's insane. Wow. And it's a decent place. But God said, hey, here's where you're living at. You got your house. And on Tuesday, Sam and Levi will be starting school down in Come Cupertino. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. So that's all. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. But anyway, I just want to encourage you guys that God is working hard. God loves us. And God wants us to know, hey, you're valued. You're going to do awesome. I love you. And I want to challenge you to realize and just accept you don't understand God's love. And as hard as you try for your whole life, you'll barely get there. And if you don't start trying hard now, you're never going to realize what it's really like. Yeah. I want to challenge you to, to go to God and understand that there's a love that you're not in touch with. And as close as you get, you're still barely even there. And if you don't feel loved by God right now, you're super far from God. Wow. Super far. Because literally, He got beaten and killed for you. Right. And so here, as, as we take the communion, which we're going to take right now, think about God's love. Try to find something that you can relate to, something that hits your heart. And now you're just beginning the road of realizing how wide and how deep and how high and how long the love of Christ truly is. Amen, guys? And, Jesus, and of course, it says right after that, now to him who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. God will do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Why? Because he loves us. Because he values us. And he's God. Does that crank? I mean, look around, guys. Guess who made all this? Dad. 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 <laughs> Dad made it. Isn't that cool? Dad made everything we got right here. Now, you don't see Dad, but it's our true father. It's Dad. So if dad made all this, guys, we're going to have an awesome time. Yep. Yeah. So I want you to really think about that as we're taking communion. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray for communion. Come on, Mike. God, you, thank you so much for uh, your love for us. Father, thanks for putting up with all our mistakes. God, thanks for not giving up on us when we've given up on you. God, thank you for loving us even though there's so much not to love. And God, thanks for hoping in us and, and having an awesome plan for our life even when we don't even know if we're going anywhere. And God, we're just so grateful to say you're dad and that we're your children. And that your love is so huge that we can't get it. But God, I pray that we can make you happy by trying to figure it out. And make Satan really angry. 
because we understand a little bit more how awesome your love truly is. God, I pray even as we feel the breeze and the sun on us, we can realize that in a way it's you smiling on us with joy because you love us so much. Let's go. You're so fired up we're here worshiping you on a Sunday morning. God, I pray that we could just melt and be broken by how incredible your love really is. And God, that it can give us a power that makes us unstoppable. God, we love you so much. God, thanks for bringing the Fergus here. God, thanks for the team ministry that you're building here in the church. God, we pray for our budget, God, to be able to meet the needs of the church. Lord, God, thank you so much for the death of your son that inspires us to do all this. God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll turn to Psalm 439 in our songbooks. 439. Follow me.